Once upon a time, there was a faraway place where the rivers were carpeted with gold. Once upon a time, there lived a man named John Ko. Adventurer, miner, mule packer. He would one day be known as Catiline. For more than 50 years, his legend echoed along the steep trails, marched to the rhythm of hoofbeats, and relaxed to the sound of a violin. Political exile, men of the people, eccentric. How did he mark the first moments of the province? Or better still, become a legend? Among those fascinated by Catiline today, we find Irene Bierke. One day she discovered that her great-great-grandmother, Amelia, had been Catiline's wife. Since then, Irene has crisscrossed British Columbia searching for traces of Catiline. Hi, Irene. Hi. Hi, Sylvie. How are you? Good. Like our man in his day, Irene lives in Yale. Like him, her vocation puts her on the road. Like him, she is married to a native Indian. Irene feels she has inherited a legacy from Catiline. She has given herself the mission of preserving the legend yes. of her hero. Well, I have my favorite picture of Catiline. <laughs> Oh, what attracts me to Catiline is his, uh, his spirit, his exploration, e everything that I've ever read about him, his honesty, the, the quirks of rubbing whiskey into his hair and, and um, you know, always being an honest packer, you know, for 55 years and going all the way from Yale through really incredible country, making his way all the way up to Hazelton, Amanika, well, Barkerville before that, and opening up the country. Um, there's hardly anything concrete on him, written on paper, really. There's, I, I can't find his birth record yet. I'm still trying. And um, his death record doesn't say a whole lot. There's no marriage records. Um, yeah, that, that one there is a, is a pretty good copy. And uh, I believe he's about 69 years old there. Catiline is a representative of the newcomers who came to British Columbia uh, roughly from 1850 onwards. But he's important because he is the best known example of a form of transport which was on the British Columbia frontier. Catiline is a fascinating character because he is representative of a very significant uh, part of British Columbia history and therefore Canadian history. And because, in a sense, he's an enigma. He is a mystery because of the lack of written records. And, and but the, the legends, there's so many legends and, you know, you know, some of them have to be fables. <laughs> First of all, everybody thought he was Basque, but he was actually French. And, you know, we found out where he was from. Oleron Saint Marie. Mm -hmm. This is the birthplace of Catiline. Here, he was born a fine day in 1830. La région dont Jean Coe venait, 
et le Béarn, qui fait partie de la grande région de la Gascogne, dans le sud-ouest de la France. C'est une très ancienne région qui touche aussi au Pays Basque et à l'Espagne. Despite the truth, many still persist in believing that Jean Co came from Catalonia, Spain, hence his nickname, Catiline. He was involved as a young man in the left wing, the socialist movement of the about 1849, 1850. And like many other young men, he had to leave France fast after the coup d'etat by Louis Napoleon in December the 2nd, 1851. And he went off like them to the New World, to the United States, and ended up in California as part of the gold rush there. But our hero arrives late to the rush. The lightning glow of California gold has already faded. In California, he obviously looked for gold, and he also learned the trade of packing. Like so many other people, as the gold mining frontier moved northwards, looking for gold in the rivers and creeks, so he moved as well. While Jean Co sifts through worthless dirt south of the 49th parallel, the gold of the Northwest is still fur. We can number a thousand Europeans employed by the Hudson's Bay Company. Fort Victoria before the gold rush was decidedly French Canadian. There were uh, a handful of families, uh, maybe a dozen, who had been officers or had been administrators in the fur trade. They were mainly from Scotland, or some of them were from Anglo-Quebec. Uh, they had larger farms on the edges of Victoria, but the life in the center of the city, the average persons were, uh, were from, uh, from Quebec originally. Meanwhile, the nature of the land has remained unchanged for thousands of years. Between fishing and potlatch, 80,000 natives live the same life as their ancestors. Their traditions are still intact, and their totem poles stand guard by the living forest. At the head of the Hudson's Bay Company, James Douglas, future governor of British Columbia, and like so many others, married to a native woman. The natives told James Douglas about glittering rocks in the riverbeds of the territory. He keeps this knowledge to himself. Douglas believes that to announce gold would fill the British colony with the trap of unruly American boots. This is to be avoided at all costs. Eighteen fifty-eight. Rumors change into headlines: gold, gold. The Americans catch the fever again, and the Fraser Gold Rush is on. Between April and August of 1858, more than 20,000 prospectors who have squeezed into vessels of every sort and kind set foot in the port of Fort Victoria. Overnight, an ambitious and overeager mob transforms this small, quiet fort into a boomtown. The forge of the Hudson's Bay Company rings day and night. Still, it cannot satisfy the demand for its picks and shovels. But the voyage is not over. The race is on. Every prospector wants and needs to be the first to stake a claim on the banks of the Fraser River. The majority of the prospectors start from Fort Victoria but they have 300 kilometers of rough terrain to drag themselves across before they can hammer down stakes. The topology of the land interferes with the easy advance of prospectors. They discover perilous cliffs and rivers churning with white waters, and they encounter First Nation peoples who do not like this invasion of their territory. The affront to the natives, though, gets worse when even the Indians get gold fever. Given the nature of attitudes at the time, a lot of the men who came did not conceive Aboriginal people to be even very human. You know, there was a bounty on Native people in California at one time during the gold rush. So a lot of people had this attitude that the Aboriginal people didn't really count. 
And so they saw them and they didn't see them when they were looking for gold. James Douglas tightens his grip. He forces each miner to buy a permit and to register with the authorities. Among these miners, we find Jean Co. He is now 29 years old. Like the others, he yields to British rule. Although the permits anger prospectors, James Douglas intends to go further and shut out the Americans from the colony. Interference from London, Queen Victoria repeals his order. Assert British law and control? Yes. Shut out the Americans? No. To ensure that the colony does not degenerate into another far west, the new government assigns future friend of Catiline, Judge Begbie, to his seat. Matthew Bailey Begbie, newly arrived from England, takes his task seriously. The government instructs him to use the whip and the gallows as need be. The Americans believe that might is right. The authority of Judge Begbie irritates them, and they begin to call him the Hanging Judge. Uh, when you read the diaries of the gold miners, what you find are men talking about getting up every morning, plodding through uh, very, very treacherous terrain, sort of day after day after day, thinking that they're gonna be the ones, the one who strikes it rich. It's rather like buying tickets for the lottery, although it was, you know, the chances are very, very flight that you're gonna be the person who makes a real living from gold mining. Far more men leave after uh, a month or two months or three months and go back home than ever stick it out. A large proportion of the men never make it. After three long years, success still eludes him, and Jean Co lives hand to mouth. He does not belong to the happy elite who lifts stones of glittering gold with every handful of river dirt. The legend still awaits its time. Sixty-two, 670 kilometers north of Yale, in a place called Williams Creek, Billy Barker discovers a gold vein where no one expected. The news explodes like a keg of gunpowder. It's about time. The banks of the Fraser River are exhausted. The miners abandon their claims in the Fraser and move into Williams Creek. Already, 4,000 miners compete for 10 kilometers of land with mines. It's the Caribou Gold Rush. Barkerville is born. Some people made lots of money. The question was, you know, isolated mining camp. What the hell do you do with all that money? Throw it around. So things they want to do, first of all, is booze. Uh, so he takes in lots of, of raw whiskey, but lots of champagne. Uh, expensive goods. What, what do they also want to do? They want to go and uh, play uh, billiards. The son of the packer said his father was most proud that he took uh, four billiard tables in from Lillooet up into the, uh, the Caribou mining uh, camps. And of course, the other thing you needed was to have the uh, entertainment, which was a piano, because that was the thing to do. So they would carry pianos on the back of one or two mules. The packers make a mint. Miners are dependent on them. All goods are transported on the backs of mules through impossible trails. A ton of merchandise that travels from Victoria to the remotest mine costs the shipper $200. To transport the same cargo to London, England, cost 20. Jean Co finally finds a fortune among the gold fields. When one comes from the precipices of the Pyrenees, one can clamber the cliffs of the caribou without fear. Jean Co sets up his base in Yale. 
he forms a partnership with Joe Castillo, a fellow Frenchman. Together, they set about acquiring mules. They supply mining camps in the farthest regions. Jeanco becomes Catiline, and a legend is born. Going where there is a demand for goods to be carried, where there are no railroads, there were no um, r made roads, he has to do on trails in which, in, which, in fact, uh, mules are most suitable for. Catiline prefers mules because they are more robust than horses. They have the advantage of having a flat back, thus making loading easier. Whereas a horse can carry 100 kilograms, a mule is sturdy enough to carry 140 to 225 kilos. But the expression mule-headed isn't pulled out of thin air. They are irascible animals, cussed, and at times impossible to control. During the California gold rush, it is likely Catiline learned the art of mule packing from Mexicans. He now directs his mule train by speaking Spanish. The leader of the pack train is called Comprador, and his assistant, Segundo. Winter. The snow settles down like a blanket, and the land sleeps. Most miners quit their claims. Mule packers and their animals sit back and wait for spring and the melting snow. The work season is short for packers. Short, but intense. Jean Co recruits his packers from among the unwanted of the colony. They are Chinese, Mexicans, native Indians, or mixed blood. Certainly everyone comments that Catalan's language was an odd mixture of basically of the languages he he tried to talk when he was uh, when he was on the when he was with his mule train on the road he talked French some French some English uh, mixed in with the Chinook which is the the trading language talking with the native peoples Chinook was probably uh, during the second half of the 19th century the most commonly spoken language in British Columbia now Chinook is essentially a jargon that has anywhere between 200 600 800 words depending upon your version of Chinook um, Chinook probably originated in the fur trade when you had all of these men coming from very many different parts of the world. You had a lot of men from Quebec, some indigenous Hawaiians, and you also had the need to deal with a whole variety of Aboriginal uh, groups who spoke different languages and dialects. And so this jargon developed, which was named Chinook because it had words from the Chinook people who were the people around Fort Vancouver. A French oblate father will attempt to give this hodgepodge of several tongues some respectability and a written script. A number of missionaries felt the Chinook presented an excellent opportunity for spreading the word of God. And one of these was Father Lejeune, who had originally come from Britain. And so he translated Chinook into the shorthand of shorthand characters. And in 1891, actually began to publish a monthly magazine. Father Lejeune christens his magazine Wawa, which means conversation. The Kamloops Wawa is interesting in the sense that it had two distinct audiences. It would be 2,000 to 3,000 issues printed every time. There were about 500 uh, local people who uh, could read Chinook. But then there were all kinds of people who wanted to support the missionary effort and support Father Lejeune, and so it was widely advertised, you know, subscribe to Kamloops Wawa and save the Aboriginal people. 
So Chinook was essentially the lingua franca of the Pacific Northwest, probably from Northern California up to Alaska. Catalines Segundo, of mixed black and native blood, is named Dave Wiggins, and known to everyone as Darky Dave. He is a reliable hand. His role? To ensure that all the equipment is in perfect shape. He spends his time repairing and checking saddles and harnesses. And then he became what's known as one of the best saddle men in the province. When they load a mule with a piano or dynamite, it isn't to see it roll to the bottom of a ravine. Thanks to Dave Wiggins, Catiline has never lost a cargo. Dave Wiggins is, is significant because he took over running Catiline's pack train after Catiline became too old and had to sell it in 1910. When the spring came, the snows melted, trails opened, Catiline would get together his animals, get together his crew. He would find a cargo, but he was always broke, so he always had to borrow the money from the bank. So he'd go to a merchant or a bank and borrow the money to go and pay the wages to get the cargo. The size of Catiline's pack train varies between four and a hundred mules. Traveling at a rate of 20 kilometers a day, the trip from Yale to Barkerville takes 30 hard days. And from there, he would then proceed to make one, two, or possibly, but unlikely, three trips into the undeveloped interior along the trails and delivering the goods he had to deliver. The outline of Jean Coe's day is simple. Up at dawn, he loads up the mules before the flies swarm and the heat starts. The men harness the mules with apareos. They are not saddles exactly, but rather leather bags filled with straw. And the day begins. The cook always leaves well ahead of the pack train. The bell of the lead mare clangs throughout the entire journey. It is what the mules listen for and learn to follow. Catline's sense of direction is exceptional. His crew trusts him without hesitation. His legend remembers him as the most reliable packer and one of the most honest ones in the region. And the mules were devoted to the mare. They would always protect her. So if the mare got attacked by wolves or coyotes, uh, then they, the mules would immediately rush to protect the, the, uh, the mare. And the mule, don't get, get in the way of a mule's kick. It's absolutely fatal. And literally, mules would kill wolves, kill dogs, anything which was got in the way. So you really had to watch it. And these people knew how, in fact, to use animals efficiently how, in fact, to keep them in good health, uh, to deal with the problems like getting sore backs or, or wounds. The cook arrives ahead of the others to prepare the camp and cook a hot meal for the famished men who have marched for hours without interruption. So from about May to September, this was, uh, took place every single day with very few breaks. 
So it's not surprising, it's a rather boring existence and dangerous and not easy. Well, sometimes you get caught in the earliest snowstorm in the fall, you just lose your mules, mules will die. And mules are they tough, but also they're pretty ornery things. If they decide they want to die, they just die. And there's nothing much you can do about it. It's tricky because you have to ford rivers and the mules can get drowned. And they're quite expensive, so it's not easy to go and replace. Uh, horses are well, less expensive, but horses are far more delicate. They keep on falling off cliffs and, and doing silly things like that. Catalan was, very, was known to be very demanding of his, his animals, but also very good with them. Obviously, very good at looking after he, the people he employed, his crew. Over time, people would build up funds and they, could, they would, in fact, buy the mules and the rigging needed to, to run the pack train. But you see, the thing was, you could easily get wiped out. I mean, you could have, uh, okay, you could get to a place, you discover that you're going to a mining site and that all the miners had left. They'd exhausted the deposits and they'd gone off somewhere else. You couldn't sell the goods. So it's not surprising that when the muleteers got to a town that they would break loose and everyone said they were swore, they misbehaved themselves, they drank, uh, they gambled, played around with what women there were. And okay, so, and I think that's again, in some ways, that's where Catiline is so typical. At the height of his glory, Catiline entered the streets of Barkerville, leading a pack train of a hundred mules. It's a ritual. After delivery of his merchandise, Catiline buys a clean white shirt. He will wear it on his return voyage. A touch of elegance or superstition? The legend doesn't say. Some believe that Catiline followed the native custom, leaving his old and tattered shirt behind to lure away bad spirits. When one lives at the mercy of the elements, one doesn't take chances. Excellent. Catiline is a spendthrift. He is generous. Money sits loosely in his pockets, and Barkerville presents many opportunities to dislodge it. At the height of the Caribou Gold Rush, there are as many as 10,000 inhabitants, choruses, a literary society, a Chinatown, a full rack of saloons. Salud. There are even women, something Catiline always appreciates. Catiline's hair is long and black. Each time he indulges in a glass of rum or brandy, he pours some in his hands and rubs it through his thick black mane, his legendary recipe for a lustrous head of hair. But the life of a mule packer doesn't lead to a life of leisure there are always more paths to blades and expeditions to organize. The great thing about being a packer is that it's nothing to do with who, what your birth is, or being literate, or being uh, white, or being upper class. It is simply that you've got to be good at handling animals, at being able to go and load them up very quickly each morning. You'll be able to, to understand what's going on. You've got to watch for problems and we find that it's mainly for men. There are, were a few women who ran pack trains, but a very small number. Uh, but the men there were, were frequently people who were outsiders like Catiline, who had to leave home hastily for various reasons, uh, who were able to survive in the wild, resourceful, uh, tough, uh, 
willing to go and take risks, but also um, uh, sensible. Nine hundred kilometers of untamed nature lie between Fort Victoria and the gold-laced fields of Barkerville. The voyage is arduous. Governor James Douglas makes a decision that spells the end for many packers. He orders the construction of a road to bring supplies to the mines in the interior of the British colony. It is the famous Caribou Wagon Road. The um, difficulties of building the road uh, to Barkerville, the Caribou Wagon Road, were absolutely enormous. And the total cost was something like a million dollars, which is a phenomenal amount of money even at the present day. Uh, for Catiline, it was great because it meant that he could move, his mule trains could move much faster, um, but also that on the Caribou Wagon Road, there were built up a number of um, roadhouses, which are still, still there. I mean, when you talk about 100-mile house, 150-mile house, those are referring to the, the roadhouses. So instead of his team having to go and uh, sleep out at nights uh, at these uh, various... Uh, rest points, I mean, which had uh, water and, and feed. Now you could go and stop your team at a roadhouse where, in fact, you could feed the mules and horses on grain and also where the muleteers could go, in fact, sleep inside, probably packed in and lying on the floor in their blankets. But it meant that, OK, it was a much more pleasant uh, way to travel and probably much quicker. So it was very good for him. The gold rush was moderating by the middle of the 1860s, uh, so much so that in 1866, the British government combined the colonies of Vancouver Island and British Columbia into a single colony um, to save money. The question became, what would happen to this remote British colony, which is running at a deficit, had a large debt because of building the Caribou Wagon Road? In Ottawa, the government doesn't want to give up this western gateway to the wealth of the Orient. But the young colony hesitates. The United States seems a more promising partner. To win over the colony to their side, the framers of Confederation pay off the debt incurred building the Caribou Road. They further proposed the grandiose scheme of piercing the Rockies with a train line. In 1871, British Columbia lets itself be swayed by Canada. It says yes to Confederation. Fifteen years later, in 1886, a passenger train from Montreal finally enters the station at Port Moody. With the arrival of trains, the cartage business is thrown into turmoil and uncertainty. Many packers abandon their routes and contracts. Jeanco, now 56 years old, persists. But the golden years of mule packing are coming to an end. First of all, he does very well out of that because he's carrying in goods to the railroad camps, all the supplies, the, the ironware, the foodstuffs which you need to build the railroad. What then happens, of course, is the railroad replaces him. But that doesn't mean he's lose, lost his business. It merely means that the the type of frontier on which he is working, that's what he's running his pack train, simply moves farther north, farther away from the established centers. So, for example, instead of working out of Yale, yeah, which he did from the 1860s, he's working out of Ashcroft. The same thing happens uh, when the railroad with the, in the far north of British Columbia comes in. Instead of working out of Quesnel, uh, he first of all, he helps to go and build the railroad brings in supplies for the railroad running from Prince George to Prince Rupert. But once that's built, then he simply transfers his base to Hazleton and starts again on a new career supplying the mining camps, the telegraph trails in the very far north of British Columbia. Because the drawbacks are there's less work, uh, it's more 
complicated. I mean, the, the season is much shorter. He's really basically uh, having up against much, uh, t probably tougher conditions than he's had before. Despite his lifestyle, Jean Co has a full love life. At the age of 44, Catiline courts a young woman named Shea Khan, but known as Amelia. She lives in Spuzzum, a native village near Yale. She is the sister of a chief and is 20 years younger than Jean Co. I would imagine that Catiline probably knew Amelia when she was a little girl, because she would have been about six when Catiline started heading through Spasm with his mule trains. The story of Catiline and Amelia is typical of a situation that dates back to the days of the fur trade, where relationships between European men and Indian women were common. The pioneer life doesn't attract many European women, thus men settled down with First Nations women. Their offspring, called half-breeds, often grow up on the edge of both societies. Amelia and Catiline will have two children, William, born in 1876, and Rhoda, two years later. This is a point when uh, Darwinian notions of the survival of the fittest gave this broad-based sense across the dominant society that race counted. The whiter you were, the more acceptable you were. A lot of white men came in and, and made real bad trades and took advantage. And, uh, you know, Catiline was known not to do that. He was known to be so honest that I'm sure everybody was happy for Amelia that she found this wonderful man. <laughs> Probably he lived with her uh, during the winter season. Uh, basically, it was somewhere where he could, somebody could take care of him, uh, mend his clothes, provide him with food. Clearly, he was probably affectionate with her, but it was uh, someone who engaged his affections for the time, gave him sexual pleasure, uh, probably mutual sexual pleasure, one hopes. Uh, but then the spring comes, March, April, May, he's off again. And I'm sure up the road, he's got some other woman who he's uh, equally attached to, who will do the services, the same services for him. I'm sure he must have, you know, had some fun, but as far as I know, she was his only wife at that time until later when he met, uh, all, all I know is her name is Mary from Wrangell, Alaska. And uh, she, she was the mother of Clemence. Yes. <laughs> um, so that, that's the only two ladies that I know of, but I'm, I'm sure yeah, he was a traveling man. <laughs> and he was dapper and dashing. <laughs> I didn't suppose that Amelia found this terribly worrying. She had went on to have uh, children by two other men. And I think she was quite in command of the relationship. She's not subservient. She seemed to be a very strong-minded woman who knew what she wanted. Three years later, the relationship ends. Each follows a different path. As the frontier gets pushed farther back, Catiline spends more time working in the north. Here, he has a liaison with a woman in Wrangell, Alaska. The daughter who was born at Wrangell in about 1877 or 78, Clemence, and put her in, first of all, into, uh, as a child, into the uh, convent in Victoria. And then he, she was moved to the convent uh, up in the couch in St. Anne's, had another convent there. And she was brought up there. When I was in Quinell, I ran across this letter, and it's from Victoria. 
that's when I realized that he had another daughter by a totally different woman. <laughs> and it's signed Clemence and G. Co. It's a nice letter because it lets you know a little bit about what's going on. She's asking him if he's still working for the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, sounds like he sent her some money, so he was generous with his money. He was generous with both of his families. But Claire, there's not a close relationship. The, letter, the terms of the letter mean, make quite clear she doesn't really know who he is. She knows he supports him. She's trying to go and find topics for conversation with Catalyne. Okay. But she did take his surname, which the other children did not take his surname. Jean Coul is naturalized a Canadian. The legend recalls with panache the story of his citizenship as it illustrates his friendship with the hanging judge, Matthew Begbie. One day, when rowdy American prospectors are threatening the authority of the judge, Catiline sides with Begbie against his detractors by unsheathing a long Mexican knife. He was n n well known that he was ac absolutely first rate with a knife. He lets everyone know that he is for Begbie. We all be dead. Judge Begbie will hear of this incident. He eventually finds a way to repay Catiline for this gesture. Uh, there is one case in which uh, Catiline was uh, prosecuted against him for perjury. It's obvious that Begbie took steps behind the scenes to go and protect Catiline. And as I said already, it is said, but I've never seen any evidence for this, that it was Begbie who sponsored him to become a Canadian citizen. But the question to me is, is this really important? He may have become a Canadian citizen, but did he ever vote? I doubt it. Uh, did he ever pay taxes? I doubt it. Catiline wasn't an ordinary person. He wasn't a respectable citizen. He was really was someone who was a roving man, a free spirit, someone who lived his life. But as time went by, I think what really became Catiline's true family were the muleteers, who moved up and down the trails and then the wagon roads and drank together in the bars and who uh, had their relationships with women in the wintertime. I think that was really more his uh, background. Most of the packers do not respect the natives, who themselves never miss a chance to return this disrespect by plucking cargo from the backs of the mules. Catiline is unique among the packers. He has nothing to fear from the Indians. On the contrary, his fairness elicits their confidence and support. With the passing of years, his connections to chiefs become a thing of legend. History tells a tale. Once before beginning negotiations, a Nahani chief burns a $10 bill as a gesture. demonstrating to all that friendship comes before money, whatever the results of the negotiations. It's more important. <laughs> the trouble with Catiline was that unlike uh, other Packers, I've discovered, uh, he, the money just slipped through his fingers and he was never able to go and stashed away, buy land, settle down, and probably because he didn't want to settle down. Catalina, I think, was a, essentially a free spirit uh, who, who, for whom life was always being on the move until his very old age in the, after 1910. In 1912, after more than 50 years of packing and tens of thousands of kilometers along the trails, the time to rest from the constant journey arrives. Jeanco, 82 years of age, sells his mule train. The owner of a ranch in Hazelton buys it and invites him to settle in a small cabin on his land. 
George Byrne took his pack train, uh, apparently almost sold off Dave Wiggins as well as part of the outfit. His entire life, Catiline won the friendship and support of those who knew him. A police officer stationed in Hazelton, Sperry Klein, tells of the final years of Jean Co. The local policeman who's left his memoir says, OK, that basically he found the money was found to keep Catiline alive in his old age. Uh, he did manage to get down to see his daughter called Clemence, the one who was born in Wrangell. Uh, she was married, uh, uh, living in Victoria. So, I don't know. I think people were, were kind to him because he was part of history, because he was... Uh, uh, people realized they owed a lot to him in retrospect. I think mean, it's one of the reasons why he's so appealing, because he is this larger-than-life figure who did these extraordinary things, like saying, uh, drinking rum and then rubbing some of it in his lovely long white locks. On October 2nd, 1922, at the age of 92, Jean Co, known as Catiline, passes away. to the cemetery first and I stop at Catiline's Cairn and I usually pour him a little drink of whiskey or rum or, <laughs> or beer over top of it because, uh, because of the hair thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of just say hi to him and, you know, talk to him for a bit and spend some time there. And This is a plaque for Catiline. It says, in memory of Jean-Jacques Coe, Catiline the Packer, 1830 to 1922. It's important for me that there's a plaque for Catiline because I, I want people to know who he was. Um, you know, he is quite famous, but uh, of course fame fades unless, unless you keep reminding people. And he was such a character and and he, he's got no other family up there. He's, he's up there by himself except for his friends. When Catiline dies, the little colony of British Columbia has prospered into a province of half a million people. Roads have spread like streams throughout the region. A mere 60 years were needed to relegate mule trains to dusty examples of antiquity. The pioneers who stepped into this faraway land to pursue their dreams didn't think history would remember their passage. Jeanco was one of them. He was always his own master. His life, it was the rough trails, the untamed nature, the star-filled nights, and always a faint dream that one day he too would be rich. For half a century, he trekked over the countryside. He led his mules up the steepest cliffs. He supplied the most isolated work camps. But more than his exploits as a packer, it is his reputation as a kind man with a full heart, his honesty, and his respect for others that has given life to the legend of Catiline. Mm -hmm. 